let's get started right away. So uh, Dr. Balch is the first speaker. So John, if you could take it away. Sure. All right, let me get my screen going. Oh, to, yeah, you can just to share your slides. Yeah. Be a problem. You, we don't, you don't need to become a host to share. Okay, there we go. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm just gonna talk briefly about what we've been doing over in our corner of the woods. We're hosted at National University. We have a great team. Uh, we are remote, so we're spread over several locations and we've been conducting this study remotely. So it's been sort of an interesting experience, I think, for all of us. So since this group is all working at the intersection of neuroscience, religious cognition, I'm not gonna talk about that at length, but our specific approach is trying to leverage new advances in the science of sleeping and dreaming to get at this nexus of how dreaming influences religious and spiritual cognition, which we think from anthropology, from psychology, and again, from these emerging methods, is a really sort of vital area where people process ideas about God, they process ideas about their significant others, and also where people have these kind of anomalous experiences that then may go on to inform their religiosity or their spirituality. So we're, we're oriented around these three sort of central questions. One, how does dreaming mediate attachment to supernatural agents and significant others? Two, what role does REM intrusion? So either in the form of dissociative states, either in the form of daydreaming or fantasy proneness, what role does REM intrusion play in mood and daily spiritual thought? And then our final sort of analysis that we're going to get into is how does frontal theta during sleep consolidate emotional and social schemas? So our design, we have, we first reach out to people online. They take a baseline survey that's pretty comprehensive. It involves a dissociative experiences scale, paranormal belief, the BIMers that I know a lot of you are using, a uh, questionnaire about concepts of God, as well as a number of sleep variables. So nightmare frequency, nightmare distress, whether or not they have sort of experienced REM enactment behavior. And then some psychological variables like the big five inventory for the adult attachment scale. So after that, we filter out anyone who whose profile seems a little suspicious that so maybe they're just trying to game the survey. <clears throat> and we also filter out people who have too high levels of anxiety that we're asking a lot in the longitudinal. And then we bring in people into a 14 day longitudinal study. So everyone in this study does a dream diary study. So at night, they tell us what they did that day. They tell us who they interacted with. They tell us their mood, how close they feel to God, how close they feel to their significant others. And then in the morning, we have a pretty sort of systematic dream diary where they not only <clears throat> describe their dream, but they also rate their dream of, along a variety of axes, which will, which we think is going to be important to our final analysis. Um, and then they also do a regular sleep inventory, as well as, again, filling out these questions, describing their mood and their closeness to their significant other and their closeness to God. Um, at the end of the process, to kind of balance all of this out with qualitative data, we then do a 60-minute life history interview. This is based on the classic life history interviews by Dan McAdams. Um, asking about sort of high and low points, asking about, you know, specific experiences with their parents, as well as we've added a few extra things that we're interested in, such as the most memorable dream, and then an extra questionnaire that asks them about their um, religiosity, their belief, how much they share their, their religious beliefs, whether or not they've had sort of an extraordinary encounter with a supernatural agent or anything like that. So, and then finally, half of the participants we're also doing all of this. Also, we'll be wearing the dream headband. Um, so I'm, I'm actually going to just skip past the numbers because it's not the most interesting part. So the dream three, which is the one that we're using, is an EEG headband that's specifically calibrated for use in the home. Um, it connects to, an, to a smartphone via Bluetooth. Um, it has two frontal sensors, two occipital sensors, as well as sort of a grounding sensor. And then it also has this accelerometer, which is pretty interesting. So that allows us to measure movement and it tells us about their respiratory rate. So the dream, what it's really well calibrated for is telling us about what sleep stages they're in, 
at every point of night. Dream itself has trained these on a lot of different data um, and has validated them pretty well. And so even before we get into the nitty gritty of the EEG, we have these pretty good hypnograms that tell us, okay, here's what's going on at various points of the night. Here's how often these participants are experiencing REM, N1, N2, N3. And then also we can trace waking throughout the night, which we can then compare against their qualitative and dream reports. So this has really opened up a lot of opportunities for us to look at, for example, different REM percentages between different kinds of participants. Um, the duration of REM, we've seen things like an increase in REM leads to increased uh, length of dream reports. And then also we can kind of try to focus in on specific dream events. So for example, um, in this case, we had a participant who in their morning diary wrote that they were having a dream involving werewolves that was becoming increasingly stressful. And eventually the fear got to the point where it woke them up. So um, one of my colleagues, Rachel Rader, then went and looked at the hip, looked at the tracings, and she found that, yeah, we can see that as they're, this is at the very end of the recording, as they're sort of entering the fear state, we surmise based on the qualitative report, their respiration is kind of peaking, and we get these really sort of intense tracings that then emerge in a waking state. So this isn't the most dramatic example, but this is just a good example of how we can balance out the qualitative report, like a nightmare report, with this more firm EEG data that tells us, okay, not only are they feeling this way, but then their heart rate is actually going up. They're actually moving around a lot and combining this kind of qualitative and more neuroimaging approach is really something we're trying to build on. So um, I'm just going to talk also about a few preliminary results that correspond with our underlying hypotheses. So one of the things we become very interested in is the relationship between dissociation and other variables in our set. So this is kind of building on the work of Tanya Lerman, which I assume a lot of you are familiar with. <clears throat> but we have reason to believe that dissociation is, well, the hypothesis that we're sort of putting forward is that dissociation is strongly related to REM intrusion, either caused by a nightmare disorder or caused by some other sort of underlying factor. But we think that dissociation may be tied to certain types of religious and spiritual states that a proclivity towards dissociation may lead to a lot, an increase in experiences of supernatural contact or uh, meditative states, flow states and stuff like that. And so when we look at the BIMERS, which we rescored, uh, I only mentioned this to the Dr. Johnson in the, in the chat, which we rescored according to the great factor analysis he did, when we look at the relationship between this sort of positive spiritual experience and the dissociation, we don't see a sort of universal uptick, but we do see this nice gradient where for some people, there's this thing profile where as the dissociation goes up, their tendency towards the sort of positive spiritual experiences also increases. We're also, again, very interested in attachment. So this is an example of where we ask everyone every day, closeness to God, closeness to significant other, wellness, and spiritual well-being. And so this is just dividing above and below the mean for that um, uh, BIMR's positive spiritual experience. But we can see that for people who are more religious, their closeness to God moves in these very sort of embedded ways with the way that they're feeling close to their significant other. You can see that sort of peaking in a very similar way and with their wellness. So this kind of provides a possible verification or at least an elaboration of some long-standing attachment to God theory, such as the idea that attachment to God is compensatory. So it's tied to wellness because it sort of works as a independent relational agent. That you, so when you feel closer to that independent relational agent, your wellness goes up or that it's correspondent. So when you're closest, when you're feeling close to your partner, when you're feeling secure attachment wise, you also feel secure in your attachment to God. And then we can see that for our less religious sample, closeness to God is on average way lower. And that, yeah, it just is not as tied up with their closeness to you know, another or their wellness at all. And then finally, we're really interested in these distinct dream events. 
So because the survey at night is the last thing that they do and the survey in the morning is the first thing they do in the morning, we can really get at these events that, are, that can only really be explained by what's happening while they're processing and dreaming. So to close out, I'll just ease with this example where this is a participant who had a fight with their partner, um, then they went to sleep, nothing else happened. They dreamed, they had a very involved dream about their partner that eventually led towards a resolution. And you can see that by the morning, they were feeling much closer to their partner. So something during the dream state helped resolve that. And um, yeah, that's my time. So that's, that's what we're working on. And this is sort of the next step of our analysis, is really zeroing in on these dream events and trying to look into what's making them tick. Great. Thanks very much, John. That was great. And it looks like it's right on 10 minutes, I think. So, right, Chanel. That's right. 10 minutes to a T. Okay, great. All right, next up is um, Dr. Carr, Michelle. Continuing the theme of rim and dreams, I think. Hello, can you can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, let's share my screen. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Carr. Thanks for organizing, inviting me. I'm really excited to uh, see what everybody's working on. Um, so my, uh, I actually just started as a research professor at the Center for Advanced Research in Sleep Medicine in Montreal. Um, and we're starting up the Dream Engineering Lab here. And I'm really excited that one of my first projects is on uh, self and other agency and lucid dreaming and neurocognitive correlates and phenomenological inquiry of dream guides. I know that's a mouthful, so I'll kind of explain it bit by bit. Um, but as I said, we kind of just launched starting in June. And so our first step, my first step really has just been bringing people on board. Um, and the people who are in bold there, Tina Paquette as a research coordinator, Remy Mallet, a postdoc, uh, Anthony Levasseur and Raphael Semin, they're all gonna be working uh, primarily on this project this year. Um, so our main research progress update is just that I've hired staff. They're all trained and ready to work on the project. We submitted ethics over the summer. Uh, hopefully we'll get approval on Mondays, their final uh, ethics meeting. And we've done some piloting and we're planning to do all of our data collection between October and July. Um, so to give you more of an idea about the study, we're interested in lucid dreaming, which is basically just a dream where you become aware of the fact that you're dreaming while you're still asleep. Uh, this is kind of a, a typical example. It's from one of my prior studies. A subject is in a bad dream that they're um, driving a car and they can't press the pedals. Uh, then they realize this is actually a recurring bad dream that they have. And so they change what's happening. They get out of the car and then they wake up. So when you become lucid, you not only are aware that you're dreaming, but you can usually control either yourself or even some aspect of the dream content. And another study we've done looked at these variations in levels of control and dreaming. So it can go from being not at all lucid. So something like the dream led me to do what it wanted, not the other way around, uh, to being uh, very much lucid, which is uh, at the top there. I was completely aware that I was dreaming and managed to change everything that was happening. Um, so we're interested in these very lucid dreams where people can really control everything that's going on in the dream. And just another piece of background information, we've done a couple studies looking at how levels of lucidity correlates with morning mood. And the basic finding is just that having more lucid dreams is associated with feeling better, having more positive mood. Uh, others have shown feeling more refreshed or having more energy or vigor in the morning. So uh, this is something we'll be looking at in the study. Uh, to give you just an idea of the protocol, um, we're looking at self and other agency in expert lucid dreamers. So we're gonna recruit 10 experts. These are people who have at least one lucid dream per week. And I think it's about 5% of the population, maybe a bit less, uh, who has such frequent lucid dreams. And these experts will come into the lab for four overnights, so sleeping in the, the sleep laboratory. And they'll also complete two weeks of home diaries and mood diaries, a bunch of trade questionnaires. And then at the end, we'll do um, an exit in interview with them.
So the goals of the study, um, first we want these lucid dreamers to elicit dream guides. I'll explain that in a moment. And then we're gonna look at links with uh, each EEG, mood and spirituality. So the task for the expert lucid dreamers is once they become lucid, they want to elicit dream guides. And this is like you call out for um, a dream guide, but we kind of define that as being a character or an agent in a dream that seems to have a very high level of its own agency, a high level of consciousness. And this is something that's been reported on quite uh, kind of anecdotally, but in research as well, that's something that lucid dreamers experience. They sometimes encounter other characters or agents in lucid dreams that seem to really have their own thoughts and feelings and consciousness, and maybe even up to a level of supernatural agency where they seem to have access to information and knowledge that you, the dreamer, didn't didn't think that you had. So they can sometimes have a, a spiritual vibe, feel like an encounter with a god or an encounter with the divine. Um, and so we're interested in kind of this range of agency that other characters can have. So the first step is a lucid dreamer tries to conjure or elicit a dream guide. And uh, from this, we can kind of see what types of strategies really work for a dream guide to appear. So how do lucid dreamers uh, get a, a highly conscious agent to appear in their dream? What types of control strategies do they use? Uh, a common one that we've seen in other research is uh, like walking through a, a door and proclaiming to the dream, when I go through this door, I will meet my dream guide. And that causes someone to appear. Another thing we can look at is physical characteristics of dream guides. Um, and we could look at how uh, trait measures of the dreamer maybe correspond with what kind of form do their dream guides take? Um, do these characters have resemblance to known uh, religious or spiritual entities? Um, are they really guided by the beliefs of the dreamer? Things like this. And then we can query levels of agency in dream guides. So asking them a bunch of questions. Uh, show me something important I should know. Are you real? Let me experience your happiest memory. Show me the creation of the universe. Uh, so these questions kind of vary in getting at, first, does this character seem to have their own thoughts and feelings and memories? And up to a level of, as I said, supernatural agency, does this guide seem to really have knowledge about the universe or knowledge about you that you don't normally have access to? And our um, kind of hypotheses are, first, we're going to look at uh, EEG activity. So we're using high density EEG, uh, 128 electrodes. And we'll look at whether um, dreams that have kind of more spiritual encounters with dream guides or dream guides that have higher agency, if they're associated with increased frontal beta activity. Uh, then we'll also look at how these um, types of dreams impact waking mood and mysticality, expecting that these more lucid, uh, highly conscious agents and interactions with these agents is associated with a boost in mood and feelings of like feeling like it's kind of a mystical experience. Uh, and then the exit interview will really go into, into more depth uh, with the participant about what their spiritual history is, what their beliefs are, how lucid dreaming and how these types of encounters and dreams uh, have maybe impacted their, their spiritual life and well-being. And I just wanted to end with a little methodological um, point, which is that another protocol we're going to be using in the lab to increase chances of inducing lucid dreams is something called targeted lucidity reactivation that we developed a couple of years ago. And it mainly just involves presenting sensory stimulation. I think I didn't share the sound, but there was a beeping sound too. Uh, so presenting light and sound stimulation when somebody is in REM sleep to increase the chances of having a lucid dream. So this is an example of a participant. They're having a dream of just shopping in a supermarket. But then when we present the light and sound cues, they notice that the, the beeping sound is appearing in their phone messages and the, the lights in the supermarket are flickering. And so they realize, oh, this is the cues from the experimenter, I must be dreaming. Uh, so we use that to increase chances of lucidity. And then uh, from that, we can also ask subjects to signal to us when they're lucid. Uh, this is, graph is from a, a colleague study, but they use the same protocol. And when somebody becomes lucid, we ask them to look left and right with their eyes three times and we get this clear lucid signal on the EOG trace. And so that allows us to very precisely analyze uh, EEG correlates of 
becoming lucid and then having these uh, encounters and lucid dreams. And I guess that is it for me. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks very much, Michelle. We can't wait to see the results of that set of studies. Um, and let me remind each presenter to check the chat because there'll be um, comments about your presentation and questions that you might be able to answer in the chat. So thanks again, Michelle. And on to Dr. Dozberg. Sam. All right, nice to meet you all. You can all see my screen, I assume. Yes, we can. All right, I'm Sam Duesberg. I'm presenting also on behalf of uh, Bernie Crespi. We're from Simon Fraser University. So just wanted to give a quick overview and progress update. So our project is looking at um, how individual variation in traits in terms of uh, autism traits and schizotypal traits may give us some insights into the neural correlates of uh, religious experience. So these are not uh, patients that have been diagnosed with autism. They're uh, typical adults that just are showing extreme variation on, on, on the traits. So it, in, a, in a sense, the underlying premise is that these two represent a sort of uh, dichotomy in uh, some underlying processes that are critical for um, a religious or individual variation in religious cognition. So we're talking about things like uh, theory of mind. So specifically, people with a high high amount of uh, autism related traits, we might we think about them as having a, a, a reduced theory of mind, reduced agency, uh, a tendency um, because of that to see um, people and other agents, including um, supernatural and spiritual agents, as, as things and more a tendency towards concrete sort of ideation, uh, systematic explanations, whereas people with schizotypal traits, on the other hand, may have a sort of hyperactive or hyperdeveloped uh, theory of mind, leading to the tendency to attribute um, states to agents that, you know, some people may not think act actually have them. So more uh, hallucination, more, more uh, uh delusions more added um sort of magical ideation and tendency to ascribe sort of mind or agency or or, or these types of things <clears throat> so in a nutshell what that suggests is people with high amounts of autism traits may show reduced um uh, and different belief in gods where uh people with schizotypal traits may show increased uh belief in god or the supernatural uh due to this sort of social brain theory of mind uh, differentiation in terms of the capacity to attribute things like agency or mind. So our project basically breaks down into two phases. So phase one is about, we're recruiting around 600 um, participants. So we've already got ethics recruited the team and phase one is largely complete. We have several hundred, but we haven't closed recording. Um, and then we're having them do some quick tests. So we're the, uh, the autism quotient and then uh, this subscale to get uh, schizotypal traits. And we're scoring a, this large number of people. And then we're looking for groups of people who are essentially off diagonal to as our two groups of interest for phase two. So people who are high on autism traits and low on schizotypal traits or the other. So we can call them uh, S and A, for example. So phase two is our neuroimaging component of the, uh, of the study where we take these two groups where we are representing these extremes within the normal um, population variants and we're bringing them back and we're recording MRI, fMRI and magnetoencephalography as well as a much uh, richer, um, a much richer set of uh, questionnaire psychometric data about things like uh, religious belief, theory of mind, intuitive phys um, physics, et cetera. And then when we bring them into the, uh, the, the fMRI and the MEG, we're going to record the, the primary thing that we're after, but not the only thing we're recording is a, is a ta is task in, in both. <clears throat> and these imaging modalities provide complementary information, which I'll explain a little bit in, the, in a bit. 
But the basic structure of the task is that the person will view an image that can be from either a god, a supernatural agent who is not a god, uh, a human or an in inanimate object, something like a uh, cosmological scene or something like that. And then they're asked to make a judgment about that while in the scanner. Um, you know, what is the extent of mind? How likely is this to be a source of morality? And what's your level um, of attachment? So we're now here, we're finished the piloting and we're on to running the these you know actual sub subjects. So we're into phase two now. And um, just to give you an idea of what this looks like, this is preliminary data from our study. Um, so <clears throat> we can't really make <clears throat> too many strong assertions about uh, evaluating the hypotheses, but this is just to show you where we're going and where we're at. So this is uh, an MEG uh, activation viewed from uh, behind. So these are the exceptional lobes on an inflated brain. And what's really here is that's this is half a second, and that's in response to a human image. And that that's not telling you much, but I think for people who are familiar with you know fMRI and MEG and uh, EEG, what MEG brings, and that's this unique combination of good spatial and temporal resolution. So you're down with about you know sub centimeter spatial resolution, and you have millisecond timing accuracy, so you can decompose the dynamics and frequency and time space in a way that's much. Um, on a totally different order of magnitude of accuracy than um, fMRI, whereas fMRI is um, much more spatially accurate and also provides uh, information about invariant of depth and things like that. So this is comparing uh, the human versus physical world, and this is just single subject, but it looks like we're getting some uh, differential activation in uh, areas like temporal parietal junction. Again, this is just preliminary pilot stuff. Um, and then on the bottom right is another thing that we can do is with MEG is put in a virtual sensor based on the MEG activation or differential activation or even based on the fMRI. And then we can reconstruct um, precise timing information or time frequency information about what's happening in that region or in terms of its um, functional connectivity in time and space with other regions like between temporal parietal junction and medial prefrontal cortex, which are classic theory of mind. Um, areas. So uh, that's where we're at. We're into the recording of phase two. And here's a, a little bit of single subject preliminary data, just looking at differences between uh, human and physical world and uh, supernatural and God. And we're seeing some differences in activation uh, in areas like medial prefrontal cortex, which is related to uh, social cognition and theory of mind. Of course, you can't really derive much about the truth of our uh, or falsification of our hypotheses based on that, but it just seems to indicate that some of the imaging contrasts we're doing are working. And just to explode that out in a little bit more detail, uh, this is the fuller sort of um, uh, set of data that we are acquiring from these high autism, low schizotypal, and uh, low autism, high schizotypal groups that we're contrasting. In MRI, we have the T1 volumetric, so we can also answer uh, any in questions about uh, relationships with uh, brain morphology, et cetera. We have the task fMRI, which is the task I described before. We also have resting state networks, so we can pull out things like default mode network that have a lot of overlap with uh, uh, social brain areas. Um, uh, anatomically and in terms of the way that they seem to load on to psychometric scores and, and, and things like that. And the, this, this provides us with excellent an, anatomical M, uh, detail and the best sort of functional spatial resolution. And then we have the same uh, key task in MEG so that we can do multimodal imaging on this, but we also have uh, resting state data and naturalistic viewing, which is essentially more ecologically valid movie watching of uh, things like gods, humans, uh, physical world, et cetera, where, so we can look at um, things like individual brain responses, Christ brain entrainment, and these types of more modern imaging. And this is a, our sort of more complete list of the psychometrics that we have doing them, uh, that we have them doing after we record all the MEG data so that we, we can get a lot of the brain behavior association um, things by extracting our sort of activations and networks of interest from the, the, the imaging and then doing some 
uh, uh, multivariate statistical correlation uh, approaches with the uh, psychometrics. So uh, that's the project in a nutshell, and that's about where we are. Oh, that's fantastic. It's great to see that preliminary data. Thanks, Dr. Dozberg. Um, on to Dr. Gooden, we talk about Parkinson's and spiritual changes. Joel? Ooh. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, right, so uh, religious spiritual uh, coping with Parkinson's disease is sort of the, the general uh, gist of the study, but uh, more specifically looking at lateralization um, and how that uh, plays a role in attachment to spiritual agents um, compared to attachment to um, non-spiritual agents. Um, uh, this is our team. You recognize some faces there. I, I will say that uh, couldn't have made this happen at all without um, Dr. Joni Keith uh, being involved early on and uh, just, just keeping things going. So I appreciate her as well. Um, aims of the project were to combine uh, these things, cognitive neuroscience, religious cognition, and, and Parkinson's disease. Uh, specifically because the history with Parkinson's um, suggests that um, people, uh, the lateralization um, may cause some restriction to um, attachment with spiritual agents. Um, so quantitatively, we're looking at that lateralization, how they differ in internal working models of attachment to God compared to ordinary and significant others, um, differ in their emotional social sense of attachment to God, and uh, differ between and or within groups from a time one to a time two. So it's a, a longitudinal study over one year. Um, uh, technically a two year study, but we're, we're doing, uh, we'll interview and survey at time one point, which we've done. Um, and we're in the in-between point now. And in 2024, probably February, March, we'll start time two data collection. Um, Qualitatively, we're looking at basically the the narratives. Um, we've we've mimicked a lot of uh, what the the Balch um, McNamara study is doing in terms of um, survey battery, some of the instruments we've used, and the um, generally the the interview guide that we're using is the same. Uh, there's few differences. Um, how do individuals with uh, Parkinson's by uh, side of onset, describe their relationships with and perceived access to, to God or their spiritual agent as an attachment figure? Um, and do the perceptions and experiences of religious coping differ between and among individuals over that one year time span um, and across lateralizations? Um, the research process, uh, we always do a cognitive screening. Um, we have a survey battery, which is uh, quite uh, comprehensive. Um, the interview is is also very uh, rich, thick data, um, about, I'd say, average two-hour interview. Um, and then we do uh, member checks, and we do check-ins um, about every three months with each participant to keep them engaged. Um, have about uh, actually 77 participants, so not all this information is quite up to date to the day, uh, but 77 participants now right around 50, 51 percent male, um, which is a high uh, overrepresent. It's an overrepresentation of females, which uh, is really interesting. Um, side of onset, we predicted, you know, left or right, but we had a lot of participants um, surprisingly sort of say, well, it started in my mouth or my tongue or um, or both sides at once um, and, and didn't really uh, express a side. Um, we have ended up uh, lots of our recruiting and snowball sampling, especially snowball sampling has led to um, recruitment in the Bible Belt of the United States. Um, and so a lot of Christian Protestants, Catholics, um, and a few, probably an underrepresentation of uh, spiritual uh, types, uh, agnosticism and atheism. Um, we are cleaning our quantitative data currently and, and uh, building, building models around that um, to analyze it, um, cleaning transcripts. We've done some initial analyses and I wanna share those uh, early emerging themes with you. Uh, we, we see that uh, special adults and mentors 
are playing a big role in in everyone's life stories and the qualitative stories. Um, they're making a lot of attributions and evaluations uh, thriving. Um, a lot of our participants are are thriving uh, despite having Parkinson's disease. I think one of the biggest takeaways for me at this point, uh, just sort of the surprising finding is is um, a lot of interviews, they'll go through the whole in interview and not mention Parkinson's. Uh, I, I don't know the percentage on that, but um, it's kind of high. We don't we don't have any leading questions towards Parkinson's, but those will be included in the um, in the time to uh, interview guide uh, to to get more at how Parkinson's has affected their their narrative um, in recent years. Um, coping with challenges and resilience, beliefs about God. Um, and uncertainties. Uh, so these are just some of the emerging themes, strong codes here, um, transformation through new beginnings. A lot of people um, talk about these new beginnings, turning points, uh, and, and sort of a transformation during those times. Um, they also, I think one thing I wanted to mention was uh, based on sort of their, their histories, if they had a, a difficult childhood uh, um they they seem to try to fix it, um, so to speak. They they try to uh, adjust their their life story and and sort of make good out of a bad thing. Um, if if they did have a strong sort of healthier foundation, familial, um, religious, whatever it may be, if they felt more positively about it, they they sought to build on it. So um, there was a lot of meaning making there to sort of. Uh, try to determine a, a conscious uh, direction forward. Um, of course, we did see some people uh, more surviving than th thriving um, and and their stories were, you know, um, indicative of unhealthier uh, lives and and um, less less uh, strong attachment, stable attachment. Um, so early takeaways, uh, people, the participants often use religious spiritual practices and beliefs to comfort themselves and others. Uh, they have perceptions of life quality, which are moderated by their uh, religio spirituality. Um, they find new purpose in life in response to their Parkinson's. A lot of people uh, often uh, feeling God gave uh, them, them their true purpose in life through their Parkinson's disease. Um, they either thrive or survive, as I mentioned. Uh, they sometimes discuss their life highs, lows, and challenges. Uh, without mentioning Parkinson's, as I said, um, they describe attachment to God in ways that are similar to how they would um, describe their how they are describing attachment to their uh, significant um, partners, uh, friends, and uh, uh, I guess closer people in their community. Um, they they do tend to use the word um, God as a substitute uh, or complementary role model. Um, sorry, the entity of God, not the not the word, but however they define God or spiritual agent uh, or force, um, they use that as sort of a substitute. Uh, if in a in a bad situation or a complementary role model in a uh, sort of good, healthier family situation, um, and as I said, had had bad or good early lives uh, that resulted in redemption or strengthening uh, later in life. So. Thank you. Thanks very much, Joel. Um, right on to Dr. Joan Johnstone. Rick. All right, let me share my screen real quick. All right. <clears throat> can everybody see that? Yes, we can. All right. Uh, let me introduce my team that's with me. Dr. Andrew Dennison and Dr. Dan Cohen are on this call. They are um, co-PIs on this presentation. And Nicole Thompson and Laura Bosk are our research, uh, the people that are actually running this program. Um, we're really, really happy with the way things are going. And it's really interesting to hear what everybody else is looking at and particularly the similarities. So our study, the name is a longitudinal fMRI study of theistic relational processing 
in individuals with neurologic dysfunction. Uh, simply what we're trying to do is two goals. The first is to demonstrate common neural networks and a universal neuropsychological mechanism for theistic and social relational processing. So basically, what is the, is there a universal neuropsychological process that can explain the experience of relationship, whether it's relationship to other people or relationship to the divine, however that's defined. The, the nature of our study, what we're trying to do is demonstrate a causal relationship amongst the right hemisphere association area, which is where we propose um, most integration of experiences occurs to create a sense of self. How that right hemisphere association area is related to the, uh, the sense of relationship that the brain creates, how that relates to transcendent experience, and then how that relates to character traits. <clears throat> Our main hypothesis, and we're working with people with brain dysfunction here at the Shepherd Center, and these are very general, but we're proposing that the right hemisphere association area or the temporal parietal junction or right inferior parietal lobe, a lot of different areas can be associated with it. That area integrates all neurological inputs, so all of our five senses, and all neurologic outputs, which are our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors, to create a sense of relationship among them that leads to a unified experience, which we interpret as a sense of self. So basically what we're saying is that part of the brain integrates all those experiences so that everything is experienced as happening to the same entity at the same type at the same time, place, and context. Based on that model, we're proposing that increased neuropsychological integration allows for experience of social relationship. So basically, you're gonna integrate other, other people's thoughts and emotions into the unified experience. So you're gonna make them mine. In contrast, if you inhibit that integration, You'll have decreased neuropsychological integration allows for experiences of divine relationship. And if you look in the humanities and the descriptions of transcendence and mystical experiences throughout history, they all talk about experiences of selflessness. Basically, there is no self, and then that can lead to experiences of connection with an undivided unity or infinite consciousness. So those are the two main um, hypotheses driving our study. Really important to understand it is we're, we're basically proposing a, neuro, uh, a novel neuropsychological process. So the first four are pretty well understood, agreed upon individual neuropsychological processes. So we can all say that in general, the brain has four primary uh, domains uh, that we process. Cognition, how we think, behavior, how we act, affect, how we feel, and sensation, what we perceive. And what we're proposing is there's this integrative experience where all these uh, processes are pretty much uh, sent to the right hemisphere association where they're provided a degree of relationship to one another. And when they're provided that sense of relationship, that means that they can be interpreted as as all happening to the same person at the same time, place, and context. So we're really focusing on this integration. And to try and give a brief uh, description of, of how you might conceptualize this, uh, gratitude and resentment would probably be um, conceptualized as uh, similar processes that differ on different affective, on, the affective continuum. There's gratitude and resentment, but they're very different. What we're saying is that they're very similar in degrees of relationship. So if you're very grateful towards a person or resentful towards a person, you have a high de degree of relationship with that person. You think of them often, they're kind of in your mind all the time, but they differ in affective valence. Gratitude, you're going to have appreciation. Resentment, you're going to have contempt. So what we're saying is that we're looking at this experience of integrated relationship that is distinct from these other processes. Real quick examples to show you how um, we think that uh, perfect examples of how this experience of integration works. 
all you have to do is look at what happens when processes are disintegrated. And basically, they're disorders of self, or you can conceptualize them as disorders of relationship. So if you look at different sensations, like asomatic nausea, it's when people will deny that their left arm is theirs. We're saying that's a disintegrated tactile sensation. And what happens is that there is no integration, so there's no sense of relationship to one's arm. So they're going to say, not my arm. So it's not even that they don't uh, recognize it. There's no sense of relation, so it's no part of the self. The same thing can happen with Anton syndrome, where people who are blind will not state that they're blind. And what we're saying is that there's a disintegration of the visual, visual stimuli, which means that there's no sense of relationship to the vision. So people say, not my blindness. Interesting, the presentation so far, um, we're interested in schizophrenia and autism also. So we'd say like schizophrenia, it's commonly conceptualized as a thought disorder, but what we would say it is a disorder of relationship to thought. So the schizophrenics have the thought, but they don't have the sense of relationship to it. So they say, not my thought. Alexithymia is a disorder of, of um, relationship to emotions where you have the emotion, but there's no sense of relationship. Alien hand syndrome is a, 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 a disorder of disintegrated behaviors. So you have the behavior, but you don't have any sense of relationship to it. So you say, that's not my behavior. I'm not controlling it. And even thing like capgrass syndrome, where people will state that they recognize a family member, but they're imposters. We're saying that that's a disorder of cognitive schema where they recognize the family member, but there's no relationship to the schema. So that's a quick um, understanding of kind of the theory driving our research. Here's our study update. We propose to follow 60 people with brain dysfunction over a year in a longitudinal study. Uh, we currently have 56 out of 60, so we're almost done collecting. Um, it is quite interesting to get people with brain injuries to stay still in a neuroimaging machine for 40 minutes. So we've had to recruit up to 71 people because we have some data that's not good. With our people with brain injury and stroke, we expect them to improve over time. And then we have people with multiple sclerosis who we expect to decline over time. So we'll expect different relationships um, amongst the variables depending on those two samples. Our procedures, we're doing fMRIs. We have a collaborator from Georgia Tech. He says he's primarily interested in default mode network, the salience network. And we're telling him any part of the brain that seems to integrate information. And then we have some spectro spectroscopy data that we're getting, looking at metabolites within the brain, but we're specifically focused on the right inferior parietal lobe versus the left inferior parietal lobe. We have baseline assessment and then 12-month follow-up. Um, and the measures that we're giving are the BMMRS of religion and spirituality, Penner prosocial battery, which is empathy and altruism. We're giving the Cambridge depersonalization scale kind of as a measure of um, disorders of the self. We have several different neuropsych measures. We're given the authoritarian benevolent God scale to kind of look at religious cognition if people view the divine as authoritative or benevolent. And then we're also doing a semi-structured interview. I'm just showing you general results for year one, their correlations. We're really interested in um, hierar hierarchical regressions for between year one and year two data, but we have some preliminary results that we are very pleased with, and they all fit um, what we would expect. These are general trends. So in predicting transcendence, decreased right hemisphere functioning is associated with increased transcendence. So basically that fits with our model that a diminished sense of self or increased selflessness allows for increased relationship with the divine. Preliminary results for character, tra for character traits, uh, increased right hemisphere functioning is associated with increased empathy on the Penner prosocial battery. And basically that means more intact right hemisphere, higher degrees of empathy. So that means that you have the ability to create a sense of relationship to others' experiences. 
So basically you're integrating their experiences into your own. So you're making their thoughts and emotions mine. <clears throat> Preliminary, preliminary results on depersonalization. And this is something we've not done before because it's really hard to kind of get objective measures of uh, measures of disintegration or has been previously stated today, disassociation. But the deep or this Cambridge depersonalization scale basically says I have uh, experiences of lack of association with my um, my thoughts, my emotions, my tactile sensitivity, my um, smell, things like that. And Dr. What we Johnstone, found, um, just a heads up, we are at 10 minutes. So oh, uh, if, if right. you could wrap up, that would be awesome. I Thank will. you. Sorry about that. It's okay. It fits with our model. Religious cognition, the uh, benevolent and author authoritarian um, God scale, it fits with exactly what we've thought in that yeah. basically... Um, if you decrease right hemisphere functioning, you have higher ratings of relationship to a God. And I'll just finish. I think people can use this if you go back and look um, at the presentation. For future collaborations, um, Shepherd Center is very interested in working with other people. We basically have access to a large sample of people with different types of brain dysfunction. We have two donor funded chaplains, so we're really interested in kind of looking at religious and spiritual interventions. Um, and then we also are associated with um, TBI and SEI model system centers, so we can get some other really um, highly regarded academic health science centers that are involved in like neurologic rehab research in, involved in this research. So with that, um, I look forward to talking to people in the future. Thanks very much, Brick. Um, great. Um, on to Dr. Just, Marcel. Okay. I want to talk about a method we've developed um, to analyze the content of meaning using the neural representations. Um, we use machine learning to break the brain's code for representing concepts. Um, so our goal here was to identify the underlying neural semantic dimensions of uh, concepts related to religion based on the neural representations and believers and non-believers. We also had two other uh, categories for comparison, government and science. So the method, <coughs> I, I, I wanna give you an example from a previous study that we did. We, you, we gave people concrete objects to think about or emotions. And we found that each item had an identifiable neural signature, identifiable by a machine learning algorithm. We also apply factor analysis to the activation patterns for the set of items to, under, to identify the underlying dimensions of representation. And of course, we try to find an interpretation for each of the underlying dimensions. So in this, in this previous study, we gave people 60 items to think about, things like apple or hammer or tomato. And you know, we put them in the scanner. We say, think about the meaning the meaning, the properties of the object that's named here. This example is Apple. And then a machine learning program can I accurately identify which of 60 concepts a person was thinking about using its neural signature. So the neural signature of a concept is a set, a vector of activation levels in about 200 critical voxels measure fMRI. And to continue on with this example, the factor analysis of these concrete objects revealed several interesting underlying dimensions. One was manipulation or body object interaction. So the concept of pliers involved the use of probably your dominant hand and squeezing. You don't see that in a dictionary definition of pliers, but it's in the neural definition of pliers. Some, some of the items like house or tent include, and even umbrella included enclosure. 
some were eating related. And each of these factors is processed in several multiple brain locations, such as manipulation being in premotor and motor areas. And analogous findings were done uh, were obtained for other semantic domains, namely emotions, physics concepts, uh, organic chemistry compounds. And we can ask, what are the dimensions the brain uses for religion concepts? Another extremely interesting facet of this results is that the, everybody's brain representations of these concepts is approximately the same. If you train the classifier on all but one participant, it can tell what the left out participant is thinking. And this works across participants who speak different languages. Uh, it's the concepts, not the words that are represented similarly in all of us. And you could see this commonality arising due to the universe, universality of brain biology and human experience. But what about the commonality between believers and non-believers in their neural representation of religion-related concepts? So here in this study, there were 45 stimuli, there were 15 uh, religion-related stimuli in the left-hand column, 15 government-related, and 15 science-related. Um, our participants, there were eight people per group, eight believers and non-believers. It's a small sample, but they're chosen from among 159 survey participants who were most extreme in their belief or non-belief in God. So again, we don't have them thinking about apples and hammers, but prayer, spirituality, and so on. And so first of all, the concepts are identifiable, very reliably identifiable, somewhat more reliable uh, among the believers, but I, I don't attach much uh, that's not the correct, somewhat more um, accurately identifiable in the non-believers, but I don't want to attach much importance. One question you could ask, you know, you can do um, representational similarity analysis. The neural representation is a vector of activation values. Okay, well, you can compare the vectors of the two groups and you could ask, which religion concepts are most similarly represented in the two groups? And the answer is deity, very surprising. And what's most dissimilarly represented in the two groups? And the answer is soul. Maybe that's not surprising. We see a very low correlation between the representations of soul in the two groups. Um, we can also look at the within group similarity of neural representation across the three categories. So you see in the religion category, which would be the central focus here, the non-believers are more similar to each other than the believers. Uh, and that's true, not only for the religion category, but also for the science category. It means that believers, whatever their however they construe these concepts, are mo more heterogeneous, at least within our sample, more he heterogeneous in the group. Um, one interesting thing is that the concept of spirituality is represented differently in the two groups. And interestingly, and you know, and it points to where the believers re uh, represented more were the non-believers. Notice that these two areas that I've identified correspond happen to correspond to the two areas that Sam Dosberg uh, and others have, have pointed out. The inferior parietal, um, maybe TPJ, and the medial frontal. And you can see it's different. The, it's the non-believers who are activating for spirituality for the non, uh, non-believers in medial frontal for spirituality. And, you know, there's a possible interpretation concerning God's involvement. This is from one of Jordan's previous papers. But you see, it's, it's, I think it's very clear that these, uh, these are two of the players, brain area players in uh, religious concepts. There's an issue of left versus right hemisphere. Uh, 
you see our our task, which is very sort of language oriented, is uh, left dominant. Oh, and all of our subjects are right handed, I believe. Uh, so a key neurosemantic difference is the is one is the fact you can compare the factors and some of the factors match. Um, let me not go into how you match them, but some mismatch. This one, for example, is a dissimilar factor where spirituality is anchored at one end of the dimension for both groups. Uh, the polarity is different, but that's not important. But one group, the believers, have at anchor the other end at religious authority and guidance with the uh, concepts of clergy, hell, and soul, Why, whereas the non-believers anchor it in afterlife sin and scripture. So you see uh, a different organization of this, uh, of this, of the, of this demen underlying dimension. Uh, and uh, the, I think this is repetitious with what I said in the previous slide. So my conclusions is that, are that this machine learning, multi-voxel pattern analysis me methods can identify key meaning elements of religion concept representations. The conceptual difference between believers and non-believers can be better understood, even for individual concepts. And the conceptual differences between believers and non-believers extend beyond religion concepts. So that was, that's it. Thanks very much, Marcel. It's a shame we can't uh, ask questions and make comments for all these fascinating preliminary results already. Um, so that's the situation we're in today, but there will be an opportunity in the future so um, let's move on to Dr. Ostafin. Yes, hello. Um, I'm just getting my screen sharing ready to go. Okay. Uh, uh, can you see what I'm presenting? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here um, and to be part of this this group larger group that's asking these immensely interesting questions. Um, the title of our project is Mysticism Metaphor, Neural and Psychological Mechanisms in Biblical Interpretation Under Emotion Induction Conditions. And this research is done being done by myself and my co-PI, Andre Aleman, who's the neuroscientist of our, of our group. Um, basically, I think at the most fundamental level, our, our our study is about the question of how religious or mythic narrative is interpreted, how it's engaged with, and based on a reading and interpretation that um, uh, uh, the emphasis, the predominance of a literal interpretation um, as a primary primary one for engaging um, mythic or religious texts is something that's a, a function of modernity. And that this sort of literal interpretation versus a metaphorical or related to this participatory uh, interpretation or engagement is, has detrimental effects in regards to the experience of meaning. And our idea is that there are different contexts in which uh, more logical versus more intuitive processes may uh, come to bear. And that the experience of awe, the emotion of awe, is one such context in which um, uh, intuitive processes may be more likely to be relatively predominant in relation to logical processes with the idea that the, the, the underpinnings that the experience of odds oftentimes defined as an experience that is so vast that one can no longer assimilate, that is use logical cognitive operations to understand it, but rather one has to accommodate, to open up, uh, basically to have an experience rather than to uh, have cognition and, and logic and propositions intervening more so, at least relatively more so, with the um, with one's relation with the world. So uh, we've had a bit of a slow start, <laughs> and in part, this is a, a learning curve on our part, my part, of dealing um, with uh, the ins and outs of uh, bureaucracies and the, the European or Dutch bureaucracies, which has a, a lot of layers I've learned, and so. It took us actually quite some months to get the contracts sorted out. Um, 
Then we had uh, the interviews for the, the positions that are funded by the grant. And we were very fortunate in getting some excellent people. So we have a postdoc, uh, Jun Sun Kim from the University of Toronto, and uh, a research assistant, Christiane Donata, uh, originally from Aruba. But she is uh, doing a research master's, completing research master's here at the University of Groningen in uh, cognitive neuroscience. And so uh, we will be able to have an official beginning in November. And again, this is uh, for bureaucratic reasons. When a non-EU member is coming in, it takes quite some months, I've learned, for human resources department to process everything. So regarding our study, there's going to be two main elements to it. One is a, an element at home, in which participants do some uh, individual difference measures and some uh, baseline measures that are also relevant for the main part of the study. And so we will be having some measures that uh, we'll have some cross uh, talk with with the other uh, projects, such as the BMMRS and um, a subscale or the subsection, the religious subsection uh, six from the Baylor Religion Surveys. Um, also measures of demographics, and uh, trust and intuition. This is not so much whether you are in an intuitive mode, whether you are using intuition, but rather you trust that as having epistemic uh, validity. It's something that you can use uh, for guiding your way through making uh, through the world, um, in contrast to using logic and reason. Also, uh, baseline measure of life meaning, and similar to some other research projects, we were looking at autistic traits and schizotypal traits, also looking at uh, experiences of transcend of religious transcendence, with including um, representations of the divine as being transcendent and transcendent experiences in prayer. Participants are uh, Dutch and Christians who read the Bible regularly, at least once a week. They'll be coming into the laboratory then at the medical center for the an fMRI scanning, uh, where they will do an fMRI scan. And during this session, we will get uh, start off with assessments of state emotion, we'll do a video induction, including two types of awe induction, a more relatively more positive awe induction and a relatively more threat-oriented awe induction, uh, in addition to uh, control videos with positive emotion and threat emotion, and a more neutral, relaxing video that allow us to disambiguate whether it's the valence of the emotion that is going to be influencing potentially the, the outcomes, or whether it's the experience of awe uh, more specifically. So during the video induction, they are also in the scanner and uh, having their brain imaged. Um, after the video, um, they another measure of state emotion, and then Oh yeah, I, I did put this in the baseline measure. Um, uh, similar to the baseline session, participants will, will evaluate five non-biblical texts and five biblical texts. They are matched on length and uh, our main questions have to do with whether or not they are read metaphorically or literally. So it'll be a, a set of 10 biblical, a set of 10 neutral, and with five and five at baseline, five and five uh, during the, the, the main session. That'll be counterbalanced across participants. After uh, they, read, uh, they read and uh, evaluate uh, the text in regards to metaphoricity, we'll also ask them to um, rate the text in regards to other sorts of elements, uh, including meaning, different elements of meaning, of a sense of comprehension, whether the, the text leads to a sense of purposefulness, a sense of mattering, also a sense of noetic, it does give them a sense of deep insight into the, to the reality, the underlying reality of the world. After this, we will assess uh, potential mediators. Um, again, here's the trust and intuition and uh, epistemic confusion or uncertainty that they experience while watching the video. The mediators, again, are, are about the experiences during the video and also looking at the effects of the video on the experience of life meaning. Our uh, questions are, are these. Uh, first one, main one is to examine whether awe leads to a more metaphoric cognition while reading Bible verses. And so the hypotheses are compared to the control conditions, uh, non-awe positive, non-awe threat and relaxation. The awe conditions will demonstrate greater metaphoric reading of Bible verses um, and uh, reading those Bible verses as existentially meaningful. The second central question examines mediators, and this will be done, uh, assessed with both self-report and uh, neural measures from the, the scanner. So one uh, 
important mediators in intuitive processing. I already mentioned the self-report trust and intuition, and we'll also have uh, neural, neural measures of intuitive processing um, uh, with tasks, uh, with, um, with, uh, with areas that have been shown in the past to be involved in intuition, uh, measures of uncertainty, again, self-report and neural measures, and measures of uh, neural measure of metaphoric cognition. So looking at elements of the brain activity that have been shown previously to be involved in metaphoric uh, cognition. And then the last question is looking at a potential moderators of the relation, the effects of the awe induction on metaphorical reading of the Bible verses. And so we will then be looking at these aut autistic and schizotypal traits as potential moderators with smaller effects being predicted for the autistic traits and larger effects for the schizotypal traits. And also to examine the uh, more typical uh, individual difference uh, experiences of religious transcendence, again, uh, as represented by um, measures of the divine as being ineffable, mystical, and limitless, and the experience of uh, the transcendent in, in prayer. So that's the, the study in, in short, and uh, we are on the cusp of uh, starting it and very keen to see what sorts of answers we get to our questions. Thanks very much, Brian. We're very keen to see those results. And I'm sure we can all sympathize with all those um, dealing with university bureaucracies and contract issues. So thank uh, you. Thanks, Brian. And on to Dr. Rome from Italy, Vincenzo. Yes, here I am. So I'll uh, uh, be talking, let me just get out of that. So about uh, searching for neural foundations of spirituality and religiosity in the predictive coding of the internal and external world. So definitely we are looking for a uh, neural foundation of spirituality and religiosity and uh, the, the working hypothesis rooted in the predictive coding account of internal and external word representation. So. In other words, our representation of the word, whether internal or external, results from the uh, integration of stimulus information, like sensory evidence and belief information, an internal model, if you want, uh, uh, prior. And actually, the important aspect that we have been looking at in the, this project is how the, the, the belief information, so the prior, uh, can be related to uh, uh, construct of spirituality and religiosity. And in particular, we have seen that this uh, uh, link could be created by looking at the belief information. So the prior uh, uh, um, on the external world that should account for religiosity while uh, belief information on the internal world should account for spirituality. So given this theoretical link, how do we test this hypothesis? Um, uh, so the main working hypothesis here is to look at uh, uh, prior uh, information and the ability that we could have to manipulate uh, the prior information, so the belief information. So we could make the uh, prior information higher, uh, provide higher weight to belief information uh, by uh, indeed manipulating, I'll get in a minute how we can manipulate this. And this should lead to a, a word representation that would be closer to the model and less to uh, pr pr putting less weight to the sensory evidence. This in turn should be able to uh, manip this manipulation of the belief information for the external world is expected to manipulate to modulate the religiosity. On the other hand, manipul uh, manipulating belief information of the internal world is expected to modulate spirituality. So the experimental design has been uh, such that we have a common prior manipulation that is tested for an extraceptive task on the one hand, an interoceptive task on the other hand, and they will then be then commonly tested uh, over an implicit association test for religiosity and spirituality. The uh, uh, working hypothesis, as we said, is that by manipulating prior index receptive task, we would expect enhancement in religiosity as tested by the IAT with no change in spirituality, while uh, um, prior manipulation in the interceptive task 
should enhance spirituality without any impact on, um, on religiosity. So uh, how we have uh, worked on this first thing, first looking at extraceptive task, how we have uh, developed this extraceptive task. Here you have the uh, a binocular rivalry task. Actually, what we did was to superimpose blue, red house fa or face stimuli that were briefly presented on blue, red filter lenses that were actually weared by the participants that allowed for one of the two images, either the house or the face to be perceived. So clearly all this combination have been counterbalanced across uh, condition and uh, um, to be uh, 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 indeed controlled for. And the question for the participant was that it was at each trial, what have you seen, a house or a face? So, so far we have tested this, uh, piloted on 32 participants and uh, um, we have really piloted several dimension to control for low level profiles, uh, uh, features of the picture and so forth. So stimulus parameters like dominant luminance type of stimuli, et cetera, or titration parameters like ocular dominance balance, individual threshold, or main task parameters like number of levels, curve fitting and so forth and also uh, how we go about prior manipulation, whether it's online or offline. So this was, uh, um, uh, uh, let's say, um, some uh, really um, careful um, evaluation, manipulation of a different aspect that has led then to the um, important um, prior manipulation. Uh, so how do we manipulate extraceptive belief information? And the idea was to, use uh, TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation. So participants uh, are induced to believe that the TMS pulses that will receive during the task, so there was an online decision to make, so during, during the task, TMS was delivered. Uh, prior to the stimulus presentation, this would improve their ability to perceive faces or houses, depending on which part of the brain we were stimulating, okay? So the important aspect here was that, uh, however, participants are not aware that the stimulation is in sham mode, so there's not inducing any real change in brain activity, contrary to the experimental claim. Uh, good, just getting to the preliminary results here, we have done some uh, computational modeling of behavior. So we have used signal detection theory uh, to show that we can, uh, in this context, to separate sensitivity from uh, response bias in the way in which we interpret our results. So what we see essentially is that regarding uh, sensitivity, which has been measured with uh, D prime, there seems to be no uh, change in sensitivity as a function of prior induction. So uh, in other words, participants do not get any better at perceiving faces or houses following uh, versus houses following stimulation. What really we have been able to change by uh, telling them that we were uh, manipulating their ability to perceive faces or houses was their uh, their response bias, their criterion. So participants, in other words, tend to report perceiving more faces than houses following the stimulation. So we've changed essentially the criterion of participants in responding to the uh, stimuli that have been presented. And okay, so the manipulation of the external prior uh, has been uh, effective in this extraceptive task. And so what is the impact on the implicit association test regarding religiosity and spirituality? We have tested this as well. And as you can see here is the D score for religiosity on the left, the two green bars and uh, spirituality on the right, the blue bars. On the left side, you can clearly see that there are higher score for high T on, uh, uh, on religiosity following the external prior manipulation, as you can see here, it gets higher, while there's no effect from pre to post TMS condition with regard to IAT on spirituality. So there's no modulation of uh, IAT scores on spirituality for external prior manipulation, which is exactly in line with the our uh, um, working hypothesis. Then going to, from the extraceptive task, I'm just going to introduce to you the interoceptive task that we have also uh, used here. It was really about looking at, uh, um, uh, at heartbeat estimation tasks. So we asked participants to uh, concentrate on their heartbeat 
uh, for around 10 seconds, as you can see here. This was a phase was followed by a second phase uh, between four and 10 seconds of a listening phase that was just listening to a hard bit uh, like this. And actually what we were um, uh, trying to ask then to the participants is to compare the, 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 their own outfit with uh, uh, the, the, the trace that they were heard to, um, to tell us whether their outfit was faster or uh, slower. Again, here also we have used um, uh, 35 participants that have been piloted uh, quite extensively on uh, different parameters like heartbeat measurement intervals, heartbeat comparative sound speed parameters, individual threshold, uh, also for the main task parameter number, so level, curve fitting, and so forth. And also here, manipulation parameters online versus offline. Again, we have opted for the online manipulation. And indeed, regarding the prior manipulation, what we have done also was to use a very similar uh, aspect that uh, I've described for the esteroceptive uh, uh, manipulation. So participants are induced to believe that the TMS pulses that were received during the task prior to the listening phase will change their heartbeat perception as being faster or slower. And again, here the stimulation was uh, in sham mode, so not inducing really any modulation in heartbeat perception, contrary to the experimental claims. Okay, so uh, what are the results of this interoceptive task? As you can see here, again, we have used computational modeling of signal uh, um, of behavior. So in signal detection theory, we looked at sensitivity and criterion. You can see that here in sensitivity, we have a certain decrease in sensitivity following prior manipulation. And this is independently of whether it was increased versus decreased heartbeat manipulation. This is possibly due to the online heartbeat monitoring task challenge. And so this is something that really needs further fine tuning, in our opinion. But yet, uh, actually, uh, uh, despite this, I think it's really very interesting to see that actually the criterion manipulation is really going well because we have a relevant a uh, change in response bias as a function of prior induction. So participants essentially tend to report perceiving heartbeat faster, slower, following uh, the stimulation according to the kind of uh, uh, information they have received. So essentially, if they think that the heartbeat is going to be faster, they will have a criterion towards a faster uh, than slower um, judgment of their own heartbeat. Okay, so... Uh, so that the, the, uh, um, once we have tested that interceptive task is also uh, able to uh, manipulate prior uh, uh, information, we have allowed uh, tested also how this impact implicit association test uh, on religiosity and spirituality. And here the results show exactly the opposite pattern of what we have seen for the exoceptive task. So you can clearly see here on the left that there is absolutely no modulation of IAT scores for religiosity following the internal prior manipulation, while instead, as we were expecting, you see higher IAT scores for spirituality following the internal prior manipulation. So just a, a conclusion on, on these preliminary results. So we are manipulating belief information impact. Uh, we see that it impacts both extraceptive and interoceptive uh, task performance and uh, indeed extraceptive task. Uh, we see that uh, actually face and house follow the, um, the, the percept of face and house follow the bias induced by the prior. And so for the interoceptive task, we see that actually uh, the slower, faster heartbeat bias follow indeed what has been induced by the prior. And we also did see that the uh, IAT is uh, selectively enhancing religiosity for extraceptive task and uh, selectively enhances uh, spirituality for the interoceptive uh, task. So the state of the art is that we have extensive uh, piloting and preliminary data analysis that have established a robust and reliable psychophysics uh, for extraceptive, but further fine tuning may be needed for interoceptive task at the moment. Also, uh, we have provided some effective prior induction for both intro and extraceptive tasks. And we have supported the expected correspondence between extraceptive prior manipulation and religiosity on the one hand, and interoceptive prior manipulation and spirituality on the other hand. Uh, 
So the ongoing experimental planning now is just to work on the working package one and two full design that has been currently implemented at the moment, so ready to start with for EG recording. So the neural part will start kicking in soon together with manipulation of a prediction error as well. That is another behavioral manipulation that we want to look at that is expecting to have different impact on the variable that we have just tested. And also there's a working package too for uh, manipulation with the transcranial alternate current stimulation of brain oscillations, which we uh, think will uh, provide also major insight into what we are looking at the moment. So also we have looked at, uh, start looking at uh, personality trait like autism and schizophrenia uh, using exactly those uh, um, questionnaire that you have mentioned in many of your presentations. So we have not yet given the number of participants looked into this, but uh, we are really looking forward for this other uh, part uh, of the results. So I finish here. I think my time should be over. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Rome. Um, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Siragu, Angela. Please. Yes. Hi. Okay. Can you see my slide? Yes, we can. Okay. So, hi, everybody. Thank you for this invitation. And uh, I'm going to present just one second because I have, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so um, the title of the proposal is on body representation of the divine, uh, which is will be investigated in three different monotheistic religion. And uh, uh, the investigator, I'm the principal investigator, and uh, this is done in collaboration with Irene Cristofori and Salvatore Agliotti from the University of Rome. And uh, uh, recently we hired also uh, a postdoc, Sara Di Marco, who I think uh, she's here, Gabriella Cucuzza, research assistant, and Guillaume Leo, a research engineer. Okay, so uh, re religious representation, or general hypothesis that religious representation are grounded in uh, at the low level and associative brain structure, in particular in the visual and in, in, in brain areas that are associated with visual and neuroceptive processing. Um, we propose two projects. The first uh, tries to um, to predict whether engaging in inner imaginary discourse with God, okay, if the subject is Im imagined to interact with God, whether this interaction activates the face patch region along the occipital temporal stream. And uh, uh, the, the important aspect of, this, uh, of this, uh, uh, this question is that we are asking, uh, uh, we, are, we, we want to see whether the, fa the uh, fa face area the face patch area is activated when, uh, um, for instance, Jewish and uh, Muslim people, uh, which is a religion where uh, uh, they cannot picture the face of God, whether in any case, face area activation is in this case mandatory. Okay, and uh, um, so the second project, uh, involve a simulation of the vagal nerve through transcutaneous uh, stimulation uh, and uh, uh, using a binocular rivalry task. And uh, the idea is that by activating uh, uh, visceral activation, uh, probably this, I mean, our prediction is that this will uh, uh, increase visual consciousness for uh, religious icon. Um, so, what uh, uh, where are we going so far? What have we have done in in this different ten months actually of this project? Project one, first of all, we we already obtained ethical approval by Santa Lucia Foundation Ethic Committee uh, for both project, and uh, that was uh, uh, a hard task because you know. Uh, the ethical uh, we uh, we we were in uh, in Rome. I mean, the the, the project is actually uh, is done in Rome, and uh, uh, when you count that ethical committee in Rome is not an easy task because uh, usually you have uh, 
uh, bishops, priests, and uh, we have we had uh, Salvatore Agnotti had to to talk with them, and actually we had a very nice insight from from uh, uh, these religious people, and uh, um, so perhaps we can talk in another occasion about this. But in any case, it was a very nice experience uh, discussing with them. And uh, we also, in the meantime, made the contact with the different communities of Catholic, Jewish, and Muslim in Rome for uh, uh, recruiting subject. Uh, project two, we, we did a market research for the device of transgender simulation, which has been already delivered. And we are collecting right now material religious icons for testing uh, uh, religiosity value for believers. Um, so the first project, as I said, uh, the idea is to, to use a multivoxel pattern analysis. And this is uh, uh, in this project is in charge of Sara Di Marco, uh, who has already a lot of experience with fMRI. And the idea is to, to, to see whether in the face area there is a specific region activated when people of different religions are thinking about God. And of course, uh, there is going to be... Uh, uh, an analysis where we will compare with uh, uh, with other faiths. Uh, how we how we can present a face of God since we don't have pictures of God, we don't know how is a face God. So one uh, we thought that one one nice uh, way is to use a reverse correlation experiment, where uh, uh, people can uh, uh, unconsciously build a representation of a uh, uh, face with a specific personality trait, for instance. And, uh, uh, and so at, in the end of the experiment, you end up with uh, uh, one, one face that uh, defines the characteristic that we are searching for. For instance, in the study that we did in 2018, uh, we, we searched for uh, trustworthiness in face, and we asked, we present subject with two different face, and uh, the subject build the trial from trial, the face uh, that was most trustworthy. So he attributed that several features to the chosen face that resembled to a trustworthy face. And here we have a single subject, a uh, single subject uh, um, uh, experiment. And here we have the mean of different subjects. And it, it did, so this is to show you that this task uh, works pretty well. And uh, it works so well that even uh, when you present this image, uh, trustworthy face and uh, uh, anti-trustworthy face to macaque monkeys, they monkeys they prefer to look at the trustworthy face. They have a preference for this face. Okay. So uh, the question is just the question is um, now. Uh, I mean, what is next for us is to use the reverse correlation experiment in uh, uh, one subject are building uh, God's appearance. And uh, um, to do this, so we, we started doing the experiment. We, we did the several version of this experiment. We have the version one, we call version one, where we ask a different session to subject to build uh, God's face, uh, the face of a young man or a young woman, old man or old woman. And I mean, the goal of this uh, preliminary experiment, it was to, to see whether we can uh, identify a specific feature of God face compared to other type of face. And this is the database that we use where we mainly um, control for age and, uh, uh, and sex. And uh, uh, in a first uh, in a first set of experiment, we we tested mainly Catholic, and uh, but also uh, five sub five Muslim subject, and uh, uh, we went up with faces that were very similar to each other. So we we change. Uh, uh, I mean, you can see that God uh, is like look like a young man, a young woman, old man, old woman, and so on. So and this is. The uh, the choice made by different subjects, subject two, one, two, and three, and but you can see that uh, across subject you have a ghost face that uh, looks similar actually, but in any case, we we choose another uh, um, another uh, um, another another set of images because uh, having face 
that looks similar like this one. I mean, it's not good for a fMRI experiment because we need to do a localizer, okay, a phase, and then we have a perceptual task. And if you have activation, I mean, the, the, we hope to have activation for a God's phase that is different from the one from other phase that will be presented. So uh, we end up with another uh, uh, image database and uh, this one, which works pretty well, actually. You have this uh, the trial of one subject and uh, we end up uh, testing a different subject with uh, this database. And uh, uh, this is God face and this is anti-God as, as, as you can see, subject build a face I mean, of somebody that looks like a man and the, the anti-God, it looks somebody that looks like a female. Um, okay, so for uh, we are uh, we are planning to complete uh, this uh, reverse correlation study in the next month, then to acquire ephemeral data collection with this uh, set of phase of images and do a data analysis. And for project two, we will run uh, also project two during this uh, period. And uh, uh, Gabriela Kuguza, who is in charge of project two, she is going to start working on uh, uh, the feasibility of the uh, different uh, stimuli that we have and uh, where they work or not and uh, uh, the parameters for uh, stimulation. Uh, we, during this time, we had also several weeks uh, meetings in Rome, Irene and I, uh, to finalize the ethical committee protocol and to discuss the reverse correlation database and methods. So uh, we are, uh, we are, uh, uh, we are advancing our project and uh, I hope to have fMRI data next time that we are going to present our data. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sirigu. Um, Dr. Wildman. Hey, everyone. It's amazing listening to all of these projects. It's just stunning what you're all doing. Okay. Can you see the proper screen? Can you tell me you're seeing? Uh, yes, yes, we can see it. Not the note screen, but the other screen. Uh, computational simulation. Yeah. Yep. Two computational models, right? Yes. Yep. Good. So this is um, a little bit odd because now you're talking to a, a group of computational social scientists and engineers who have a different, quite a different goal. So I'm speaking to a whole bunch of people who know a lot about the brain and I'm not one of them. So there's a, there's a bit of a gap between our expertise types, most likely. What our job is, is to, is to work with experts on brain stuff. Uh, that's what we call it as engineers, brain stuff. And we, uh, we create computational systems to describe cognitive processes in the brain. So I'm going to show you the two computational models that we're working on. And uh, this is the, the team. Uh, I don't have a picture of Chloe, unfortunately, but Patrick's mainly the person whose brain we're trying to juice to get uh, information <laughs> for these computational systems. So I'm just going to give you a quick introduction to computational simulation, after which it'll be easier to understand the two models. That's where I'm starting. The computational simulation is often regarded as the third leg of the scientific stool alongside theory and experiment. But it's um, becoming increasingly important in a host of different fields, which is Really interesting, uh, pretty much no one will build anything these days unless they simulate it first because it's quicker and cheaper. And you can do the same thing in scientific contexts as well. The simulations are executions of models over time. Computational simulations execute a model on a computer. And computational simulations can be of several different types. Low-level agents connected in a system. They can be high-level overviews of a system. They can be sequences of events in a system. Here we're presenting system dynamics models, so they're high-level overviews of cognitive processes within human minds. 
and they're reflected by events that trigger key processes. So they're very high level models compared to neural models. So you'd call them neurocognitive models to express that. Okay, simulations. The first model has to do with simulating the emergence of supernatural cognition through dreaming. And the question is why and by what mechanisms do dreams and nightmares lead to belief in supernatural agents? It's an interesting strategy, we think, to try and produce in silico the very thing that you're studying in the real world. And uh, the lovely thing about being able to do that, if you can pull it off and validate, validate it against real data, is that you've got real reasons to think you've captured the causal architecture of the real world system inside your computational system. This particular model has a whole bunch of properties that I'm not going to be able to explain, but you'll see that there are personal factors uh, of the particular mind that we're looking at. There's a distinction in sleep architecture between REM and slow wave sleep. There are image properties, which are very important in this model. Valence, dominance, and arousal of nightmare images uh, are held to have uh, very important effects. Moreover, perception of those image properties might be different than an objective observer's assessment of image properties. Thus, perception itself can be changed by agent characteristics. There's the way people recall their dreams, and there's this possible feeling of loss of agency, especially in images that have high dominance, and the variables affecting the degree to which this experience of agency is lost are fairly well understood. That's part of the hypothesis of this model, really. The model looks like this. Uh, there's a whole bunch of personal characteristics that make someone vulnerable to experiencing an a, a dream character as having a tremendous amount of control, which would be one of the signals of a supernatural agent. And uh, there's a nightmare loop, uh, which looks something like that. And the nightmare loop then uh, causes effects with regard to whether or not an, an, a dream character is experienced as a supernatural agent. Um, again, I can't really go into the details, but that is the model and we're the data that we're using to validate this model is the data that you heard John Bolch describe right at the beginning of this meeting today. So the second model has to do with simulating nightmares among elderly people, which is known to be a vulnerable popular, a population like children when it comes to nightmares. And that has a lot to do with brain changes as people get older. Uh, in this case, there's a kind of an onion story to tell. The core of it is the Levin-Nielsen neurocognitive model of fear extinction, by which uh, scary images from daytime experiences get disassembled and teamed with other images, and then in a certain way, uh, depotentiated so that they can be moved to uh, long-term memory and thereby uh, uh, not interfere with days, uh, daytime function, and uh, not cause distress at nighttime and so on. Uh, ordinary dream Im images go to deep, deep potentiation easily, but nightmare images can be very difficult because people wake up, the dream extinction loop fails, and it can fail in a bunch of different ways. And this Levin-Nielsen model uh, is a formalization of a, neuro of a neurocognitive model in a computational system, which showed that you could actually render the Levin-Nielsen model coherently. And that was uh, published a couple of years ago. It was theoretical, though, with no validation data. You can see there the basic parameters for that model having to do with uh, image characteristics and agent characteristics. And the outputs we were looking at were nightmare distress, nightmare effects, anxiety, and nightmare frequency. Now, that's the second layer of the onion understanding that model. Uh, that whole thing you're looking at now is tucked across on the right. And this is in order for you to be able to see what the elderly specific parameters are. Things like neuroticism, PTSD, stress, depression, cognitive control over emotion, which is something that's known to change with age. Executive score, same thing, and PTSD image arousal. These measures uh, affect the inputs to the computational model. The next layer of the onion puts all of that stuff there and then uh, goes to the data set that we've been collecting. These are the measures that we used that feed in to those uh, particular variables and those 
are the abbreviations. You'll recognize them, I suppose. PTSD checklist, the cognitive control and flexibility questionnaire, the DAS scale, adult executive functioning scale, and the big five personality scale. Uh, we collected this on prolific.co. We've got 60, over 60 people aged 65 years and older who report frequent nightmares and uh, a similar number of age and gender matched controls who report no nightmares. Now, based on the data set alone, uh, we've got some powerful predictions. The measures that are listed there on the left can predict nightmare frequency, nightmare distress, nightmare effects, and anxiety measures with 74% accuracy, roughly. That's the target then for the accuracy of the simulation. We'd like the simulation, which brings a lot more to the table than just, uh, just regression, uh, it brings a ton to the table in terms of a causal architecture. If we can get our predictions up to that level, then we'll know a ton about what's actually going on causally inside the dreaming process. Mm -hmm. So then uh, to wrap up, I just want to make it clear what the payoffs of computational simulation are. Uh, computational simulation is an artificial causal system designed to model the architecture of a real world causal system. So if you can validate a computational simulation, you get two gigantic assets, which are extremely precious. One is you've got powerful causal inference that you don't have when you run regressions. Uh, or, uh, basically, and, unless you're doing some very complex longitudinal study or randomized controlled trial, it's very, very difficult to get strong causal inference. But this is a, another and relatively new way to get causal inference. And second, a validated simulation is a virtual test bed for ethical and affordable experimentation to uncover treatments for difficult conditions and also to explain why treatments work. So that's what this crazy group of engineers in Boston is trying to do by uh, by juicing Patrick McNamara's brain for all it's worth and building these computational simulations. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. I don't know how much McNamara's brain is worth, but <laughs> thank you. Um, so um, on to um, Dr. Arzai Shahar. I know you were just coming out of a, another big meeting in Jerusalem. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know yeah. if you feel up to uh, updating us on what's going on with your group in Jerusalem. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Somehow it says it's a host. Uh, yeah. Well, now the host is letting me also to see me. Good. Um, I wish it was a meeting in Jerusalem. It was an interview to the to the ELC, so now we mostly need uh, like a group support. It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a tough experience. Um, so first of all, I apologize for coming in late and for my uh, spiritual uh, mood post. Uh, uh, maybe Vincenzo or Angela know more about it. Maybe you are under one such a thing from one side of the table or another. Um, so we are in Jerusalem, we are making a, a small part of the project. We are actually, by being in the intersection of uh, several religions, um, as we, we are able to, we have access and we are able uh, to record data from um, religious people in several religions. Um, personally, I'm working in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and in the Hadassah Hebrew University Hospital. And in the hospital, it's like a little paradise in Jerusalem. They hope you will be able to visit us. It's a place where people from all races and all religions and uh, all ideas are working together for patients from the different uh, from the different groups. Um, there was one, um, the representative of the Spiegel in Israel was hospitalized in our department and said, "Hey, what is this? Um, I'm always like uh, reporting conflicts. I guess sure you should report this." He said, oh, yes, I will come, and he never did. Um, said that the editor said it's not interesting. Um, so um, together, so, so we have a group of, uh, we have a, um, a, a group myself and uh, Dr. Munir Abusnan, who is an Arab friend, is responsible to the movement disorder, and uh, two students of ours, um, 
Zalman and Daniel um, working on the on the project. Um, and we are doing like, like under the projects that uh, John has uh, uh, detailed in the beginning of the meeting. Um, we finished already the recording, almost finished, we have two more um, to obtain the um, healthy people from, so we have 10 from each, uh, each religion and with it, which we record for uh, um, 10 days with uh, the dream uh, headset and uh, well undergoing all the different tasks and uh, the different questionnaires. And we are now entering the second phase of patients with uh, Parkinson's disease. We already obtained all the necessary. It was a little bit difficult with the hospital and with IRB and everything. It was much easier with the health subject with the university, but uh, we did this as well. We already did the pilot with uh, um, two patients. And uh, yeah, and I hope that now we, we, we have already a list of patients that are going to attend. and. Um, and I hope that um, we will have all the data in a due time. So that's updated update my side. Thank you very much, Dr. Oz. I very much appreciate that update. I know you came from that big meeting. Um, so, uh, but that's it. I think we're almost right at the time that we wanted to end the meeting. Um, let me share my video, yeah. Um, so thank you everybody for presenting. Um, Jordan, do you have any last comments? Or... You're muted, Jordan. <laughs> Which is quite unusual, isn't it, Patrick? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I wanna thank everybody for coming and presenting. I, it's obvious we're all at different stages of completing our research. Uh, my guess is, uh, even though uh, Patrick and I want to have uh, an end of grant meeting, we might also have another interim meeting to catch up on where you are in your research sometime, uh, perhaps in the middle to uh, of next year as well. So uh, we're very happy uh, to take questions by emails. Uh, you can please keep in touch with us. Uh, make sure I need a paragraph. I need a paragraph from each of you sent to me so I can uh, uh, please the Templeton Foundation with our with our progress. Uh, I just also as a reminder, the original grant uh, instructions were we have three years. That's the end of money after three years. I will try to make an effort. They say they don't do it, but I will try to make an effort to see if we can get a no cost extension. But I'm not counting on it. So you really need to uh, finish up what you can. Uh, Patrick and I also have uh, some uh, a preliminary work we hope to start soon with the UK Biobank. And perhaps we can uh, present that next time. That ought to be very interesting, uh, hopefully data, I hope. So Patrick, anything else you wanna say? Just very quickly, um, you, you probably all heard that most of the groups are um, administering the BIMARS and the Baylor religion, a section of Baylor religion. And we're hoping some somehow to at least discuss whether or not that data can be combined into a single publication with a very big N with diverse set of populations completing those measures. And uh, so that may not be possible, but that's on the agenda for discussion if anybody's interested in that. And then finally, at the uh, towards the end of the overall project, we're planning a, a final meeting, of course, and we're, we're inviting reporters, um, other distinguished scientists from outside the field. We have one of them with us today, Dr. Newsom, and uh, so it, it will be a much bigger meeting with a lot of um, outside interest and people present. And so that will be approximately a year from now, probably some, somewhere around there towards the end of the overall project. So again, we apologize that we couldn't have a real discussion with, with, with this meeting, but uh, it's great to hear where everybody is. 
and just diverse range of tools, methods, and questions being investigated. But obviously, a lot of really interesting overlap between studies as well. So, so that's it for for me as well. Thanks, everybody. Uh, any final words, Jordan? Or? Nope. We're good. Yeah. Well, let's finish on time. That's what I like. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes. Okay. We're we're in the time frame, uh, and you can move on to your next meeting. God forbid. Yeah. Take uh, so anyway. Enjoy your time. We'll be in touch. Don't worry. We'll be in touch. Take care. Thanks, thanks everybody. Thank you much. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.